What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the 100th episode of the Bituation Room podcast live stream. I am your host, Francesca Fiorentini. You've seen me from this show. That's fucking right. This show right here, the Bituation Room, which has been going now for over a year. No, over... Okay, almost three years. The point is this. It took a long time to get here. It feels like it's been 15 years. Welcome to the world of podcasting. But we are here. We're so excited to have you here. I'm excited you press play uh, on that little PCAST. And uh, we have such a good show. Um, you know, not all good news. I feel like the Taliban got word that like it was my 100th episode. And they were like, yeah. And I was like, no, no. But that's what we get, you know, that's what occupation hath wrought. So we're going to get into all that. We're going to talk about the latest anti-vax insanity, which has to do with semen. And uh, we're going to talk about the infrastructure bills that are coming down the pike and all the ways that these moderates are trying to stymie it. Um, in addition to the things we're bitching about. And then, of course, in honor of our 100th episode, we're keeping it 100. All right. How are you keeping it 100? What are the thoughts, opinions, ideas, the things you just know in your soul and heart? Save them and tell me. Uh, we've got a great show. Nando Vila is here. Jennifer Jaje is here. Super excited to have them on the podcast. But first, you might notice, oh, dear viewers on Twitch and YouTube who have already pressed the like and subscribe buttons and rung the bell, that I am wearing a piece of merchandise, the fucking Frantifa. Wait, wait, don't cover it up. Don't cover it up. Here we go. Here we go. Frantifa, our newest piece of merchandise, are, are one of multiple things we've got on the new store. Now you can throw it up. Bituationroom.com. That's right. We got shirts. We got totes. We got stickers. And the best part about it is it is all from Fee Marketing, which does AOCs and Bernie Sanders uh, swag. So it's all union made, all made in the United States. Uh, sped no expense. Sped no expense. Um, but get your shit there. Swag yourself out. Um, I think that's how you say it. It's not. But I want you to be dripping in Frantifa swag, bituationroom.com, if you are a patron uh, and you've been a patron uh, for three months, at least, uh, I'm sending you swag. All right. That being said, that's, that's for my top tiers, my top tier patrons. All patrons get 20% off though. Uh, you will get a code when you become a patron, patreon.com slash situation room. You get a code for 20% off. If you've been a patron, I will send that to you right now. But for those top tier patrons, the innermost cabal, the Orchata Armada, the Franny Pack, all those people, man, you've been there for me. You really have. You've been for the, here for this podcast, for the comedy, for the analysis, for everything in between. And, and I hate to get so goddamn sentimental, but man, I am. And I, I'm super... Uh, thankful to have you guys as an audience and, and thankful for the small but mighty team uh, that we are from across the globe. So yeah, you'll be getting that. And I'm super excited and so happy uh, to give that and provide that to you on this 100th episode. Holy shit. Uh, another announcement in addition to all that is that the Bituation Room is going to be live. That's right. Live, in the flesh, in person, COVID safe. We got an outdoor fallback, but in Portland, 
on September 2nd, which is a Thursday. Uh, I'm going to be in Portland with Matt Lieb, uh, with a local organizer named Max Smith, and then with a guy, an a civil rights strategist, uh, thinker, um, writer, author named Eric Ward, who has written all about white supremacy and um, and sort of like the foundations of white supremacy and anti-Semitism. And uh, he's super dope. We're going to have a great conversation. It sounds serious, but I'm sure there'll, there'll be some levity. But that's going to be live. It's at the Alberta Abbey, if you know where that is. Tickets. Uh, you can get them bit.ly slash TBR Portland, bit.ly slash TBR Portland. Get them tickets. I want to see your bright, beautiful faces after all this time. Uh, obviously masked, obviously vaxxed. Okay. Don't be giving me the fucking Delta. Um, but that'll be so good. It'll be so, so, so good. A and just to thank you once again for being here and for joining the squad, joining the Frantifa. Ba -da -ba -da -da. All right, we got a lot to talk about. Let's get into it. Um, wait, wait a minute, what have I done? We've got to thank the, let me be real, few but mighty big tippers and patrons um, who have given to this podcast. Uh, so without further ado, here is what I hope is the audible fart song. Yes, 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 yes. We got a lot of space. Uh-huh, because there's not many people. But uh, let me get there. Thank you so much to Anna D for becoming part of the Orchata Armada girl. Uh, Anna told me her whole, like, she just got arrested by California Highway Patrol for some BS trying to film them. Anyway, F that. You're dope. Uh, to Big Tippers, Karen K. Thank you so much, Karen, as always. Every single week, you really come through. Uh, to new Twitch subs, DGN193. I hope that you're subscribing on Twitch, everybody else. Because that's all we got for this week. I'm muy sad. But wait, hang on. Hang on. I also want to thank Robert Gilbert for the tip. Um... And uh, I think that's it. Wait, hang on. Let me check my. I'm like, let me check my cash app. By the way, if you're wondering how you can become a big tipper, TBR dash live on Venmo, TBR live on Cash App. Yes, I will slang. Uh, you know, slang for these hoes. Um, Joseph L, thank you so much, Mauro. I don't know if I. I thank you, Mauro. Mauro H, thank you. So Mauro, Mauro, eh, Mauro, sei italiano. Bene. Molto bene. Okay. Um, before, before I fully get into it, and I know it's going to be a long show and whatever, but I, I just want to shout out all the people who've been on this show and just thank, you know, everyone from all the guests that we've had um, to the comedians that we've had who've like rolled with the punches. You know, we've had Basim Youssef. Um, we've had Nato Green, obviously, my Nato Green, the homie, Matt Rogers. Um, J.R. Jackson from TYT, Sam Cedar from the Majority Report, Stephanie Kelton came on to talk all about, uh, um, you know, modern economic theory, Alicia Garza talking about BLM, Robin D.G. Kelly, just the sweetest, most thoughtful uh, 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 mind and and most creative revolutionary, I think, of our time. Um, Ken Klippenstein, Jamie Loftus, I'm just going through all these. Uh, uh, Trita Parsi, Anthony Atamanik, Bill McKibben was on, Naomi Klein's been on, just, just Kim Kelly was on, just the best people. And of course, my boo Matt Lieb. Love you, and thank you for being uh, my, uh, my bonus bitch, which is, he usually comes on the bonus episodes. But let's get into it this week. What are you bitching about? Okay, uh, very quickly, um, I am going to just say, because we've got a lot, of get, lot to get to today, um, I've been sort of up in arms, annoyed at the lack of seriousness that uh, progressives in California are taking this recall of Gavin Newsom, which could actually happen, and then we'd be stuck with someone like Larry Elder or uh, John Cox or a, a YouTube influencer who people swear is really good and his politics are great, but he's like a landlord influencer, and I don't, I'm not, no. 
we don't need more inequality in our housing market. Uh, but I'm glad you got a few people rich, including yourself. That's fine. Cool. Um, and so I, I, you know, I created content. I did a TikTok. I did a TikTok all about how messed up and how undemocratic this recall system is and how bonkers it is and how much I fucking hate Gavin Newsom and I hate having to defend him. But the system itself ma makes it such that like even DSA in this state is like, y'all, we have to vote no on this recall if we want to actually make progress and move forward with any kind of, you know, plans for the future, just plans just to have a future. <laughs> and someone in my comments, and I usually don't give a shit. Like, I don't give a fuck what you put in my comments. Go comment. I'll block your ass. I'll dunk on you. I don't care. But this guy was just like, Francesca's such a shit lib. Francesca's such a shit, a shit lib. It's a shit lib. And I, like, let me explain to you, homie. Understanding the political process doesn't make you a shit lib, all right? It makes you smart. Just because you understand how a recall works and you're strategic about that doesn't mean you're a lib, doesn't mean you support Gavin Newsom. And this is my thing. You know, my mom, for example, is not a socialist. She's not a radical. Maybe some progressive ideas. She's a fairly standard liberal. She made hella calls into Georgia to flip that election, right, for Warnock and Ossoff. How many calls do you feel like these lefties who whine online made? How much did they actually work when it came to like changing the balance of power in Washington so we can finally get shit done? Or at least we have a chance to, let's be real, right? Like that's not a radical act, but actually it is. Actually, it might just be kind of a radical act to actually put, do the work. Vote no on this recall, get people to fucking vote no. So I'm just, I hate, the bullshit purity and the like, yeah, 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 shit, yeah, 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 yeah. You know what's radical is just staying at home and whining about everything, just not doing anything, and then having a really pristine analysis of why everyone else is doing it wrong. And that's honestly what I hope to promote on this show is very much a, a revolutionary optimism and um, and a positivity that is is based in in action. Uh, and not based on only seeing the internet as a place that you organize. That's why I bring on organizers. That's why it's important to bring organizer. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> All right. And with that, joining me in this little hot box of revolutionary optimism uh, is an LA-based actor and comedian who's performed on stages across the US, the UK, and the Middle East. Her TV credits include the Emmy-winning Amazon show Transparent and Netflix's Messiah. But these days, you can mostly find her on Zoom getting upstaged by her rescue dog and cat. Please welcome Jennifer Jajay. Hey, thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. I like that your cat is just like sexy as shit behind you and like, hey. I'm yeah, better I was, than Jennifer. I was literally looking at her, giving her the stink eye, like, don't even think about coming over here. It is way too early in the broadcast. Like, give it an hour. <laughs> Last broadcast, uh, our associate producer, Ellie, um, her new cat jumped on her laptop. And so she made a magical appearance. And um, and it was very, very funny and cute. Like, and now we've put that cat down. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I don't. I sent my dog away today. I was like, you're going somewhere else. You will be somewhere else for the day. <laughs> All right. Before we get too into this, I want to bring in uh, the host of Jacobin's Weekends, uh, who has a recent episode called Lawmakers Keep Failing the Homeless on the Homelessness Crisis in California, um, out on Jacobin's YouTube channel. Check that out. Please welcome Mr. Nando Villa. It's a pleasure to be here. How are you guys? Good. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Feeling really good. Very good on this someday. You made me feel optimistic with your little. Oh intro. yeah, yeah. Oh you good. Know, things can be bleak, and you know now I'm feeling. I'm feeling good. Good. Hey, if I if I can make Nando feel less cynical, I've won. I've <laughs> the 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 calmest. Uh, yeah, the calmest person on the left. I feel like you are. I'm sorry. I'm just suggesting this. <laughs> um, like I've made him feel hope, but okay, yeah. we, this is not a time for hope. Unfortunately, this is a time to bitch. So we open our show with what are you bitching about? You heard what I was bitching about. I want to go to you both. Jennifer, what are you bitching about? I'm always bitching about Palestine. I'm always bitching about Palestine. Honestly, as a Palestinian, like really it's like number one on the topic of lists to bitch about. Um, 
it's fallen off the radar for everybody. I feel like with everything that was happening in Gaza a couple of months ago, all the bombing and um, death, uh, that people yeah. were like up in arms and, you know, mobilizing. And I felt like people were speaking out and now it's all but kind of disappeared and uh, onto the next crisis. So it's frustrating to me that people, um, you know, the occupation didn't end, like the suppression and the, you know, kicking people out of their homes and arresting people and harassing people and killing people that didn't end. But, uh, you know, the appetite for the next media cycle is here and on to the next. Right. Right. Because those displacements in East Jerusalem and Sheikh Jarrah are continuing. Ongoing, ongoing every day. And, um, yeah, people are fighting for their lives. People are losing their livelihoods. I mean, there are, you know, tragic tragic videos of people coming out and like watching their home be demolished and yeah. elderly people just watching their homes be demolished and uh being given the option of demolishing their own home or they can have it demolished for them and pay for it you know and so it's just completely <sighs> devastating and it's That's really so crushing yeah Ugh. it's like you know what we'll give you a discount demolish your own home and uh 50 off you know the the idea <laughs> Right. You save on, you save on parts and labor if you demolish your own home. You exactly. know, you have to pay some soldier to do it for you. Yeah. It's a good exactly. deal. You <laughs> if you wear the Israeli flag as you're doing it, it's free. You're like, damn it. Yeah. All right. Um, that is a good thing to bitch about. Very important not to allow, you know, the media's sort of cycle to dictate how we talk and when we talk about Palestine. Um, but yes. Um always on our minds, as they say, as the slogan goes. Um, Nando, what are you bitching about? I'm bitching about a uh, fairly, I mean, I would say innocuous thing in the grand scheme of things, thing, things given, given what's going on in the world and all the political crises we're suffering and you know the situation in Afghanistan and Haiti, all that stuff. Caveating mm -hmm. that this is like not actually that important. Um, <laughs> I, I've just been, I've just been aghast with like more, more, more just stunned at this new Spanish right wing meme. You know, I'm from Spain originally. My family's all from Spain. Um, yeah. And the, there's like a kind of uh, um, a new emergent kind of radical right wing in Spain uh, led by a party called Vox. No relation to Ezra Klein or his uh, website. But, uh, <laughs> but what if it was, though? What if it was? I mean, I that's one of the things that, you know, if I was keeping it 100, you know, one of the things I really believe is that Ezra Klein is a secret founder of Vox. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> But uh, their new thing is that this week marked the 500th anniversary of the conquest of Tenochtitlan by Hernán uh -huh. Cortés in the Aztec Empire. And they're very uh, mad that no one is celebrating that fact, that Hernán, Hernán Cortés liberated uh, hundreds of Mexican tribes from the oppressive and cruel and brutal Aztec regime and Montezuma. And that Hernán Cortés was not a conquering genocidal maniac, uh, that he was actually a liberator, a hero worth celebrating. And he's like, why, why? They're like, why is no one celebrating this? Like, this is so weird. And uh, that, that, you know, we liberated one of the most brutal, uh, you know, we ended one of the most brutal regimes in uh, human history. And I'm just like, I can't believe that anyone buys this shit you know like i i don't even know how to react because i saw people in my family's group chat sh talking about this and stuff and i'm like i don't really? even know where to begin to uh to dismantle this like this is just so insane that anyone would believe this shit <laughs> because so there's a meme that's actually kind of like making the rounds on family chats yeah. it's like yeah how come we aren't yeah. celebrating that totally Damn. like and, and vox vox tweeted it out uh they tweeted out like some big thing um, and, you know, talking about this and, and people are just like, yeah, uh, you know, this is, this is something worth celebrating. Yeah, of course. You know, like, look at the Aztecs. They were brutal. They sacrificed virgins and stuff. And I'm like, oh my God, like <laughs> the rewriting, the rewriting of the conquistadors is just amazing. Yeah. Like, the, it's like is it our time yeah. now? Can we, are we yeah. liberators now? Okay, cool. So it's like woke to be pro conquistador. Like, yes, yes. no, no, no. Yes. <laughs> No, I love, yes. first of all, you know that there was someone celebrating that in the United States and his name is Mel Gibson. And look, <laughs> he's got, <laughs> we've all seen that movie. What, what the hell was the movie where, where it was basically, <laughs> yeah, it was like, which the whole thesis was like, you see, they, they were savages before. <laughs> yeah. 
No, it's great. <laughs> the, and the other thing that they're saying is that, like, what are you talking about? Like, the Spanish con conquistadors were humane compared to the British. You know, right. have you ever seen, like, there's no mestizos in North America. You know, there's there's no mulatos in, in North America. In Spain, we would sleep with the natives and we would intermingle right. with them. The British, they would not touch the natives. Uh, and I'm like, you people, like, why do you even care? Like at this <laughs> point, like, so why bad. do you feel the need to do this? <laughs> like, who gives a shit? <laughs> no, know, like, I know. Like, yeah, it's uh, uh, that's rapists. the what? Uh, the the myth of the benevolent rapist. Exactly. Yeah. It was. Mm -hmm. Um, it's crazy. Yeah, but before we murdered them, we procreated. Anyway, no, it's so true. We're gonna get into that actually a little bit later because there's some new census data that. Hot census data just dropped. Y'all mm. were excited about the IPCC report. It's about that census data. So we're, we'll talk mm. about uh, people of mixed origins. Um, uh, in fact, let's get into the week. Um, a lot of things happened this week. Uh, this was back to school week, y'all. And to celebrate, DeSantis signed an executive order banning school districts for making face masks mandatory for their students and staff. Yay! Biden uh, is going to help with some cash uh, to those schools who go against this draw, uh, this whole thing. Um, a QAnon father murdered his two children because he thought he was saving the world from monsters, uh, despite himself being the actual fucking monster. Uh, Britney Spears' toxic father will step aside in the battle for conservatorship. Yes. Amy Coney Barrett surprisingly refused to block a plan by Indiana University to require, his, require students and employees to get vaccinated against COVID-19, which I think makes her pro-choice um and as if haiti weren't dealing with enough uh recently there was a massive 7.2 earthquake that left and has left more than 700 dead uh but for everything else this is the week where this was the week where this was the week where anti-vaxxers hit their broiest, as some are claiming that their unvaccinated semen will be worth millions of dollars in the future. A concept so dumb, it makes you wonder how any of them found their way to the egg th in the first place. Dudes, uh, dudes on Reddit are saying things like unvaccinated cum will be the next Bitcoin. Got to bring this up. Is unvaccinated sperm really the next Bitcoin? Ta -da! <laughs> <laughs> and I honestly see the correlation. Look, because like the more you talk about Bitcoin, the more cum you'll store in order to sell because you're certainly not getting laid. Um, but are they right? Are they right? Surprise. No. Uh, on the contrary, being vaccinated exponentially raises the odds that you'll get sick being, being unvaccinated. And if you contract COVID, your swimmers will too. The SARS-CoV-2 virus has been found in testicle and penile tissues of those infected and could lead to infertility and erectile dysfunction. Uh, or as Brett Ehrlich of TYT says, schlong COVID. That's my favorite joke. In, in people who've contracted COVID-19 and in those who've recovered, the virus has been detected in their semen too. Mm. Damn it. Damn it. Um, also, the irony of all this is that sperm banks apparently under COVID are having like a really hard time actually filling their supplies right now. They're looking for donors. So um, I don't know. Maybe this has taken more of a hold than we think. Um, what do y'all think about this? Have, have we reached peak unvaccinated conspiracy? <laughs> 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 I mean, I, you you two live in LA just like I do, right? I mean, I, I, you know, the, the anti-vax thing predates the COVID stuff, certainly here in LA. I mean, it, it was worse. When I moved here uh, five years ago, I was like shocked at how prevalent it was compared to Miami, which is not like some progress, you know, it's not like, it's not like Miami. Really? Um, yeah, it was like way worse here. And I just, I've never really understood where it comes from or like why specifically vax, uh, vaccines. Gwyneth Paltrow. To is it her fault? Do we? Is that like she's the one who we have to blame for all this, right? I think yeah, so. It, it's woo woo white women. It's for sure this weird spiritual woo woo white lady thing going on in LA on the West Coast that is yeah. definitely pushing this agenda forward. I mean, I know so many 
uh, 30 something white girls who are like, I don't want to get vaccinated because I want to have a baby and it affects your fertility. And I'm like, okay, where are you learning this information? One even told me her doctor, her um, naturopathic doctor told her not to get vaccinated and (laughs) offered to give her a fictitious vaccination card. Jesus. See, I was like, I was wondering where these people were getting, because people, no, of course it's not legal to have a fake vax card. I mean, who's going to enforce it? Obviously, if if you do have a fake crime, it's a huge, it's like you can do jail time if you have, if you are like carrying a fake vaccination card. But you'll be served only vegan food, you know, as per your QAnon shaman God, you know. (laughs) indicates no it is very much like women who are able to and people who are able to buy their they think that they're buying their way out of like real science because they've been taking like non-fda approved supplements for so long and this is just another it's like that's the other thing is like people who've got covid and it sucks there's a lot of breakthrough cases they do have lasting erectile dysfunction like that should be a major reason to get a vaccine and to be very 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 safe other people are like, now I can't taste coffee good. Now coffee tastes like ass to me, which is like Matt Lieb was like, oh, now I'm wearing a mask even though I'm vaccinated everywhere, like no matter what, because I, I need coffee to taste okay. What if coffee wow. starts to taste like cum and they just sort of switch? And yeah, then you I, come I, coffee. I don't know. I think that might be worth it. What's up? I think you're torturing more people than you're helping. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if, if Gwyneth Paltrow's on board, I'm sure she'll pay top dollar for some vax free cum. You know, she she's rich. She can do it. But yeah, your your point, Jennifer, about it's boo boo white women. I mean, I think that that's the real red brown alliance because I mean, people are are saying this is a partisan thing. And I know that like Trump, you know, is pushing his people to, to you know, and that's that's definitely having an effect. But like I see plenty of like what you would describe as like, you know, progressive new agey type people in Santa Monica who are who are against it. So I feel like that's the real that's like the red, the budding red brown alliance is like people who do like crystals and stuff and uh, yep. and like MAGA types. Uh, they could they who could knew? form their own little yeah. They they call it there is a name they call it Wooanon. Oh, um, this is the new thing. It's Wooanon. It's pastel QAnon. There's like ah, uh, there's a whole. It's fascinating and disgusting and scary, but it's so true that like it was just like a pile of you know what is it like tinder and then someone like COVID just lit a match and now they're all coming together um around being anti that i feel for the children i like i actually now yeah. i'm like a save the children person because of these people and their kids who are like i oh god <laughs> what are you doing mom you know why are you yelling yeah. at people in a trader joe's <laughs> save the I, children I, from <laughs> you know the fact- I, I pride myself yeah, go ahead. Sorry. And the fact that I find really weird is that there is not like there are nobody's dating or getting laid. So it's like you would think all these men would just be rushing to sperm banks to like make some cash off their like backed up load. I don't understand what's going on <laughs> with that. Like, or, you know, maybe this is the advertising they needed. The show is the advertising they needed to know that that's available to them. I heard yeah, you can yo, make some just... decent money doing that. Yeah. Well, giving you can def- definitely make money giving sperm, which like I kind of get like in COVID times, knowing that there can be COVID in sperm, not wanting to go to like a place where there's lots and lots of sperm. Um, but like you could bring it in, probs. You know, it's a good way to make money. Look, those unemployment benefits are running out, people, and people need donors. People want to make babies. Um, so uh, do that with your vaccinated sperm. We are a pro vaccinated sperm podcast. I want everyone to know that. Um, and uh, and with that, let's move on. Uh, Cause you know, there's more in the news. This was the week where Joe Biden showed that he could unite the Senate in passing legislation once he backed away from all of the things that he believed in. Uh, the Senate passed a $1 trillion infrastructure bill which includes uh, just $550 billion of new spending um, in things like bridges, roads, $66 billion for Amtrak, uh, for Amtrak, which is Biden's you know, personal little pet project, which is enough money to bring that rail system into the year 1989. Tight. Uh, there's woefully inadequate money, though, to deal with climate change, of course. Here was my favorite part of the infrastructure discussion. 
Um, the legislation also includes more than $300 million to develop technology to capture and store carbon dioxide emissions from power plants and $6 billion to support struggling nuclear reactors. Struggling nuclear reactor. Like, the phraseology is so funny. Like, oh, my God. I don't know. I'm just a struggling nuclear reactor. I'm, like, waiting tables and, like, doing auditions, like, whenever I can. And, you know, I'm just trying. I'm just really struggling out here. Um, but the other thing that if you noticed in that is that there's going to be a whole study on the job losses associated with Biden's decision to cancel Keystone XL, which is like, yeah, no, that's totally what we should be doing right now is being like, how many jobs did we lose by not destroying the planet? Um, so, okay, before we get into the discussion about this, uh, 19 senators did vote for that one point trillion or one trillion dollar infrastructure bill. Um, and the entire idea, if you haven't been following, is to break this into two pieces, right? So it's to pass the infrastructure bill bipartisanly, uh, which they did in the Senate, and then pass this budget reconciliation in order to get more the everything that was left out, which at this point is three point five uh, billion dollars or trillion dollars, excuse me, three point five trillion dollars. Um, that includes things like home care, money for housing, clean energy, tax credits, transportation, innovation on green tech uh, and the like. And that needs a simple majority to pass. Right. Bernie Sanders as budget chair put this up. Now, here was a plan. I'm sure you guys have been following this. Progressives were like, we don't want to pass the infrastructure bill if you don't also attach the budget reconciliation to it. So we're going to withhold our vote. We're going to wait until the Senate clears the three point five tr trillion dollar budget reconciliation. Then we'll vote on it, you know, kind of like, you know, leveraging to prevent against the filibuster, blah, blah, blah. Nancy Pelosi, surprisingly, super on board for this. Nancy was like, OK, we'll get it done. We'll do that so we could da 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 da. Now, of course moderate Dems in the House say they don't want to do that. Nine House Dems tell Pelosi they won't vote on the budget resolution till infrastructure bill passes. Nuh-uh. And let me just say, look, I rarely say this, guys, but let Nancy fucking legislate, okay? She is only good at one thing. She's not good at empathy, but she is good at whipping votes. She can do it. She can do it. But now they're, so now they're holding out. And then like clockwork, like fucking clockwork, guess who else doesn't like the $3.5 uh, trillion dollar budget? Key Democrats say the price tag on the $3.5 trillion budget blueprint is too high. Senator Joe Manchin the third. I don't care. Why you got to have the third? Really? Uh, West Virginia, key Democrat moderate, announced on Wednesday that he was unlikely to support a $3.5 trillion economic package just hours after he helped advance a blu budget blueprint that would allow his party to craft legislation with that price tag. This man is the most fickle bitch, I swear to God. Uh, so not just Manchin, Cinema is also like, no, I don't... Mm. I don't want that. I don't. It's too expensive. Um, this has got very wonky real fast. But what do, what do you guys think? Uh, Nando, have you been following this? Do you think yeah, this will been... get over the finish line? Um, I, I, I suspect that there's like a 60 percent chance of it getting over the finish line. I think it's better than 50 50. Um, I think one key thing, well, I mean, really, it's it's a it's a game of chicken right now between um, the conservative wing of the Democrats and, and the sort of more progressive wing. And it's interesting because the the House majority from the Democrats is so thin, um, the, the progressives and the and like those nine Congress people have the 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 swing votes, essentially, like they could bring the whole thing down if they wanted to. Both sides could. So they're really just like mm -hmm. staring at each other, like who's going to blink first? I suspect that with the president behind this um i mean i think by i get biden is like desperate to pass both these things um yeah. i suspect with the president behind it i don't think that these kind of nine nobodies that are you've never heard of like they're just like they're nine of like the bums that you've never heard of like literally you've never heard of any of them <laughs> you're a um, bum yeah uh i don't think they have enough institutional backing and backbone to be able to um stand up to the entire party if that makes sense um especially if uh, the progressives indicate that they'll 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 knock it down if this is like if if Pelosi caves on this um, 
which is possible um, that that yeah. you know AOC and all these people would will would knock the whole thing down. Like you need the mutually assured destruction um, for this to right. go through. Um, the three point the the one the bipartisan infrastructure bill is like totally awful. It's like just truly awful. I mean, the fact that nineteen Republican senators voted for it just tells you all you need to know that this thing is like just a heinous heinous bill. But the three point five trillion dollar reconciliation bill would be maybe the best piece of legislation to pass in Washington in 50 years like it's like literally wow. that it's that there is no no comparable piece of legislation since probably the great society uh from lyndon b johnson or maybe some policies that nixon passed like the epa or whatever but like nothing nothing like that has been passed in since the 19 early 1970s and would be mm -hmm. pretty transformational and would probably save joe biden's presidency which is already kind of on shaky ground um so yeah i mean it's kind of like the political fight of you know the last several decades, at least, you know, yeah. like it, Obamacare, it looks like a joke compared to this and think about like how transformational oh, that seems God. in retrospect, right. not so much, but like, yeah. And this is like a, you know, this dwarfs that by orders of magnitude in terms of the expansion of social welfare for regular people, uh, you know, the reduction of the Medicare uh, age from 65 to 62, uh, the child tax credit, all these things like would, would genuinely improve the lives of millions of people uh, in a way that, legislation just doesn't do in Washington or hasn't done in, in, in decades. Mm -hmm. Not to mention it's the most consequential climate bill in U.S. history. Like, hello, we need to, I, I'm all for the progressives, pull, you know, pulling this move and trying to really pressure to push these two bills through together and not split it up because that just seems like a game that they are not going to win. Yeah. Well, and and no, of course they won't win it, right? And and the fact that Nancy Pelosi is on board is like that gives you a sense of that she understands they're all it'll be, get filibustered if they don't do this in that se sequence and in that order. They don't withhold their vote until the Senate fucking comes correct. Um, and this is totally like it, if progressives cave on this, then I'll become one of the it's a fraud squad. Like I'll be like the fraud squad people if they if they like just vote for some bullshit because you know they. They have the upper hand, I think, or at least a ton of leverage. Um, but yeah, man, of course, mansion and cinema. Like, what do you guys want? What do you, do you want a statue? Do you want, like, do you want like a Scrooge McDuck, you know, a swimming pool full of all the money that fossil fuel companies and others like gave you? We'll give you that. You could swim around in it, but just vote for this. These are two states that would arguably disproportionately benefit from the things that are in the infrastructure bill. Um, anyway, let's move on. Let's, let's take that pause as a hint. Um, this was the week. We're moving on. This was the week where our grand plan was revealed. And by our, I mean the multiracials, the mutts, the hyphens, the half-breeds, the one-drops, the hoppas, the blasians, the mestizos, the mulatos, the Korean tacos, the middle lever on the soft serve, baby, the swirls. We reveal that we will inherit this land. Let me explain, because the new U.S. Census data dropped, showing that for the first time in U.S. history, the white population declined. Let me pull this up. The share of white of the white population fell from 63.7% in 2010 to 57.8% in 2020, the lowest on record driving by driven by falling birth rates among white women compared with Hispanic and Asian women. The number of non-Hispanic white people shrank from 196 million in 2010 to 191 million. Mm. White people. Does this scare you, Nando? <laughs> Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely like one of those, like, uh, you know, like the, I have to check like Hispanic white or whatever. There's like a, there's like a right. subcategory, you know, there are literally dozens of us, uh, no. um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's, I mean, they've, they've been talking about this kind of, the, you know, the demographic shifts in America for, I mean, uh, certainly since the last census, I remember in 2010, um, when yeah. I, I mean, maybe it's because I was at Univision and that was like a big topic of conversation within Univision at the time. <laughs> you guys were like, uh, hell yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> about the emerging, his, emerging Hispanic population in, in the United States. And um, we sold many shows on the demographic shifts, shifts totally. in the United States. Totally. We were like, we oh, need yeah, yeah. more Spanish language, Latino, but English language shows on Latin America. Anyway, 
Um, that was exactly it. <laughs> he made millions of dollars on this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> totally. You're like, eh? No, but obvi I'm obviously joking and putting it on you, but, you know, fragile white people are freaking the F out. I'm not pulling the Tucker Carlson clip where he's like, see, um, you got mad at us for talking about the great replacement theory, but it's kind of happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what he yeah. says, right? I've got to I've got to admit to you guys that I actually am the white person in the room. Um, mm. I didn't want to let you guys know, but as a Middle Easterner, we are technically considered white. That's true. Mina oh. region, Middle East, North African, Iranian, we're all considered whiteies. Um, so That's I'm true. curious, you know, with this shift, if like people are deciding to like define themselves differently in terms of like, is does that like is part of the shift of what's happening that like. Hispanics and Middle Easterners are now like refusing to check the category of white or where, like, I'm wondering how much that plays out into totally. I suspect, a, totally. I suspect a good amount. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what the, a lot of folks are saying, but also, um, people are doing it and having kids. And that's yeah. why I talk about the rise of us. Cause I want to say that of course, while the right is freaking out about, oh no, there's not enough white people, birth rates, the birth rates, oh my God, of Western civilization, you know, they're replacing us. Why do their dogs say guau instead of bark? You know, all that stuff. Um, the reality is not so straightforward. In fact, it's not that there are more, there, there are in fact more white people if you consider that there are more multiracial people. So this is from NPR. This is an interview with, I actually don't know who this is, but they say it depends on how we're defining white. If we talk about people who checked off only the white box on the census form, the size of this group and its share of the total population have dropped over the past decade. But if you expand the white population to also include people who checked off white and one or more of the other racial categories, like a me, then the white population has grown since 2020, since 2010. And the bottom line is that white people still make up the largest racial or ethnic group in the United States. You hear that, white people? You're not going out of business. You're setting up franchises. You got to understand this, all right? You got spinoff <laughs> brands. Just ask the Spaniards in Tenochtitlan. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, this. you hear this a lot in Europe and you hear it a lot in Israel. You, you mentioned uh, Palestine earlier, but like, you know, Israelis talk about like demographic changes all the time. And you hear it a lot in France. Uh, you know, there are some people in France are very freaked out that like, you know, Muslims might be able to vote in like a majority uh, in, in their parliament at some point. And uh, right. you don't hear it as much in the United States. Like you do hear it like Tucker Carlson, obviously, like, you know, talks about it all the time. But it's not as widespread as as it is in, in Europe where they talk about this shit all the time. And I remember in the last census, uh, like, again, I was at Univision at the time and, and we, we spoke to a lot of political scientists um, who at the time, this was like the Obama years, and they were like, these demographic shifts are going to ensure this permanent democratic majority. Do you guys remember that? Like the, that whole talk? Of, uh, and I don't know, I don't know we, we covered it all the time about how yeah. the demographic changes were going to. And it then and then we got Trump, you know, and I was like, what the hell is going on? Um, and it just voter suppression. Oh, right. right, right. <laughs> like, yeah, that, there, there's definitely like that's like the big that's the big thing is that like the institutions of this country are rigged in such a way that even though white people are two thirds of the population, their political power is is even greater than that, you know, because yeah. of uh, you know, the, ma the makeup of the Senate and gerrymandering and voter suppression and all, all that stuff. Um, so the, the, that demographic is destiny argument that a lot of Democratic strategies made uh, back in the late Obama years just hasn't really played out. And it's and it's and it's it was just I feel like it was a way for them to be complacent in their uh, appeals to voters and in their and in their attempts to fight voter suppression. You know, they, they just didn't they didn't see that the right was just like organizing yeah. furiously and 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 <laughs> instituting all these laws all over the place um, to to do that. And and they just did basically nothing to stop them with one of the th sort of factors being like, well, you know, we'll, we keep on getting more POC on our ranks and they're going to they're taking over and, and, and we'll be fine. Um, and it just didn't really play out as, as what they thought it would. Yeah, I mean, it was very much uh, taken for granted um, that the new immigrants 
like this is Tucker Carlson's entire thing is like they're importing Democrats. And it's like, OK, um, yeah. a lot of things uh, <laughs> here, a lot of things have to happen <laughs> for you to do. They're importing, importing voters. No, they're not. Not if you're like keeping hundreds of thousands of people detained or deported. You know, like imagine if the world of like they're just democrats you know what they, they're just rolling out the red carpet and treating immigrants so well and then just setting them up with you know telling them about their rights and helping them vote it's like we wish we wish that were happening no they're doing yeah. just the same policies that trump was doing yeah. except they're not you know totally separating children from their family members they're imprisoning them all together yay <laughs> yeah <laughs> and like and the other thing is like you know, and so it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, you kind of like want to call the Dems on taking for granted that people of color, and it's the most cynical essentialist identity politics ever that you assume that people of color without your attempt to help or do anything or deliver for their communities are going to automatically vote for you. That's the real story, you know? Um, but <laughs> anywho, yeah. I love that. I love the idea of like some like Democratic bureau, Democratic Party bureaucrat, like at the immigration importation office, you know, uh, interviewing people from like Guatemala and be like, what are your thoughts on Nancy Pelosi? You know, like, what's <laughs> yeah. your, you know, like hey, oh, you like her? Yeah. Come on in, baby. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, that's they're, like they're, a Project Veritas, like, you know, uh, yeah. like some kind of video that they'll totally go to the border and be like, so, show a picture of Pelosi. Do you like Nancy yeah. Pelosi? Yeah. Like, what uh, are your thoughts on what? this woman? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> see you see um, yeah, i think it's really interesting how the demographic threat rhetoric of like these crazy right-wing uh governments like the israeli government um is now like trickling into our crazy right-wing elements and so it's yeah. like totally reflecting that because i remember as a palestinian we were always referred to as demographic threats and oh, it's yeah. like, well, step it up, Israelis, have some babies. What's your problem? Like, we're just like, we're sorry that our birth rate is so fantastic. But <laughs> we're kind of like bombed into oblivion and all we can do is screw. So, you know, <laughs> your fault. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, we, it, we can, you know, you're stuck in your village all day. What are you going to do? Um, yeah. <laughs> But honestly, I, I think it's very it's really interesting of this like fear of the minority takeover, because we've been told as minorities for years, like, there's no discrimination. There's no this like you got we now. And it's funny now the majority is like, fuck, no, we don't want to be minorities. Like we will do anything to not be the minority. So like it's interesting totally. how like that dynamic of like oh what does that uh power play mean to you and like what are we upending what yeah what actually play? what do you mean by equality here right oh no not not demographically equal and by the way i do just want to say i know i said it facetiously but you know i am chinese and italian my parents are both immigrants and i am very i obviously we need an anti-racist politics but i'm like also you could just sleep your way to anti-racism <laughs> um not always but i do believe in like heavy interracial mixing. And I think America agrees. Um, even though multiracial Americans are a relatively small part of the population, the increase over the decade was substantial. All right. Number of Americans who identified as non-Hispanic and more than one race jumped to 13.5 million from 6 million. The number of Hispanic Americans who identified as multiracial grew to 20.3 uh, 20 million from only 3 million. In all, the two groups now represent about 10% of the population. Um, yeah, we've I've got some other some other crap, but uh, I also think it's kind of cool that you can. I don't think you could check two boxes years ago in earlier senses. So it's changing, and this is the last thing I'll say on all this. I've been reading some critiques because every time this census data drops, it reinforces. I saw in the comments, you know, um, the concept of whiteness in and of itself, right? The mm -hmm. cons, these concepts that like do. And like scare the the the, the racists, um, they scare the Nazis. Uh, they use them as recruiting tools, and they are ultimately like, you know, we're not talking about multiracial Americans and how there are more white people if you consider that there are more multiracial people. Like no one's. That's not the headline. The headline is white people are having, you know, the birthing rates are declining, and I feel like no one is actually being um, honest about the stats, and certainly not talking down people off the ledge because it's a great headline. Oh, no, white people. Oh, this will, we, we really want the Nazi click. You know what I'm saying? Um, so look, 
if you are fragile about the declining birth rates of the white community, um, you might be a little, you know, you might be a little fashy. Just watch, watch the fash. Whiteness is a construct. And, uh, you know, you be have some Irish pride or wherever the fuck you're from. Let's move on to our big topic of the week. The Taliban. Boop, boop. Okay, no. Um, but first, before we get into Afghanistan, I wanted to go to some comments. Uh, Stephanie Smith on YouTube, thank you for the super chat. Are you going to do any sort of meet and greet when you come to Portland? Yeah, of course. Of course. Uh, I'd love to meet you. Let's smoke a blunt. Yeah. Okay. So you have to be the last one I talk to because I can't, I can't be high and the mask will go down and I'll just slobber all over. It'll be weird. Uh, on the unvaccinated semen, loudest carry on Twitch, save the children from their parents. Absolutely. Ashes 610. My kiddos tell me her friend who is still going to school says no one has a mask. I haven't checked in with my brother yet. I need to. I'm a great sister uh, to see how his first week of school went. I bet it was difficult on the infrastructure bill fonzu on you on a uh, twitch oh the dems are corporate owned hashtag surprise pikachu huh? on mansion That's and cinema not twitch. passing the bill <laughs> yeah hell yeah twitch. twitch is it was a hashtag though that feels like more of a twitter thing okay um okay. no judgment but ghost dog tv give them all the statues so we can tear them down again soon that's on mansion and cinema on the census theo dylan who runs the world swirls I swear to God, I love that is probably the f my most favorite comment ever in the history of these hundred episodes. There you go. Theo Dylan, thank you. And Ashes again, yay, says this pale ass mom, LOL. I don't mind being less white supremacist. <laughs> you shouldn't. Very good. You passed the test of the census. Um, all right. We're going to move on to uh, this week. Uh, obviously, it only took a couple weeks, but the Taliban have recaptured Afghanistan. This is the sitch. Did it, did it. So, um, yes, the Taliban has recaptured Afghanistan, uh, specifically Kabul after the longest and most costly war in American history proved a worse failure than those of us who marched in the streets against it could have even predicted then. Um, the last couple of weeks, the Taliban have been advancing, taking city after city, as the United States um, had a pretty swift withdrawal, and uh, they've recaptured them. Uh, and then today on Sunday, Kabul fell, and President Ashraf Ghani departed Afghanistan. Here he is. All right. We're waving, we're saluting, we're uh, goodbye, and my work is done. That was so easy. So that was President. One more wave. Yeah, could have done some some peace signs, but we didn't get the peace signs. Um, well, I feel like we need to just roll credits on this now. Just kind of like ba da ba ba da ba. Obviously, there's a lot more to say, but I have been livid about this all day. Uh, just the unconscionable amount of failure, given all the money, given the $2.23 trillion, which is definitely on the low end, the amount of fraud and waste, the bloodshed, the refugees. Um, and they're the military, the so-called, you know, the trained U.S. trained military, Afghan military, was not able to uh, resist any of this. And there's a lot of reasons why. I'm just going to go through some uh, some tweets that I saw and appreciated um, from Zishan Alim, who I believe is a freelance reporter with MSNBC. He writes, the reason Taliban fighters are succeeding is not because they're crushing Afghan security forces. It's because the security forces are not fighting. Why? Afghan security forces have been working out deals of accommodation and surrendering quickly during the conflicts with the Taliban because they're not properly supported in terms of logistics, reinforcements, and supplies. They don't have a sense that costly fights are worth it. Uh, he goes on, the U.S. has built a security apparatus in Afghanistan that could never fend for itself. Uh, experts like Adam Noah, who explained that the U.S. has built an Afghan security apparatus that over relies on U.S. support and a small set of Afghan special forces. The upshot is, is that Afghan security forces were essentially destined to be overrun when the U.S. left. Uh, that is a failure of U.S. policy. Um, I was going to bring up a photo of like the 
the head of the head, like the Taliban leaders sort of basically in parliament running stuff. Um, but it was, I didn't, I, anyway, I'm sorry. They looked, they were very much like we in charge now. I dare you to say shit, say shit. Um, but thoughts, responses to this news. Um, Jennifer, how you feeling? It's devastating. It's devastating for the people of Afghanistan who've endured decades and decades of warfare and occupation and passed the hat. And what are, you know, it's for the women in Afghanistan who are now being left to what kind of fate under Taliban rule? Like, this is absolutely unacceptable and heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Nando, what were your what were your reactions when you saw this well, happen so quickly? I mean, I, I guess the 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 reality is, I mean, there's all these there's all these pe like kind of security analysts and policy experts and stuff talking about um, the so-called failures of U.S. policy in Afghanistan, and um, I just think that that's it, it. It makes you it makes you believe the fiction that had the United States done something slightly different, if they would have just implemented some other tactic or something, it would have been better. The reality is that the U.S. occupation had no social base um, in Afghanistan, and the fact that the government, whatever, whatever that was just evaporated as soon as the U.S. stepped out means that there was no social base at all. Um, if there were a social base, there would be, so there would be, you know, people that were there willing to defend it, but there just wasn't. Um, mm -hmm. And, and to call what, you know, the U.S. did in Afghanistan is a, a failure is, I think, kind of missing the point. It's like it, it, you then you believe the fiction that the United States actually wanted to do something or some sort of good thing in Afghanistan. And what they really did was like a transfer of wealth of like, what, $2 trillion from taxpayers to the owners of weapons manufacturers. I mean, like the be the bearded Chomsky eye, like yelling at you, like it's the corporations, man. Like that guy's like broadly right, you know? Um, <laughs> and you know, like he, that guy is right. And, and, and that's what the Afghanistan war was for 20 years. Yeah. There was no, yeah. there was no, it was to, to think that we could have done something different and built like a stable, humane, you know, situation in Afghanistan is just imperialist, imperialist hubris. Like, you know, to think that we have the, not just the ability, but the right, the, you know, the moral obligation or whatever to do something in some far flung place in the world, um, you know, just misunderstands the, the, the nature of how imperialism works. Like if you're not yeah. willing to do it, you know, like meaning like kill a lot, a lot of people and like occupy a country forever. Like you're just, it's never, it's never worked. And it's never going to work in, in, in any human society ever. Like there will be resistance. Yeah. People don't like to be occupied. Um, people will fight back. And 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 that's what happened in Afghanistan. I mean, I just think that mm -hmm. the only the only humane thing that the United States could have done in Afghanistan, um, you know, the only I mean, I think I supported withdrawal, uh, you know, forever. I, I opposed the war when it happened, but I supported withdrawal forever. And the only humane thing that the United States could have done is a robust refugee policy where we would have just let in like you know, as many people as, as, as why as they, as they, that would have been the humane thing to like, you know, offer, you know, uh, a free flight. Yeah. To the United States they're, they're uh, for all the victims. Treat it like they're I mean, Cuban, Cuban refugees, you know, somewhere yeah. esca escaping socialism. Totally. Come one, come like all. That, exactly. Like that. And that guy who was talking about like, you know, the United States created this, uh, you know, relied on so-called Afghan uh, special forces. The intercept uh, just a few months ago did a massive investigation uh, about these so-called uh, special forces. And really what they were, were these death squads that were just murdering children in schools. And like they documented dozens and dozens of massacres in schools uh, that these CIA trained death squads were were carrying out on. And, you know, and like yeah. then you wonder the, the, why you're the Taliban seeing... has more of a social base. Totally. And you're seeing like, oh, Warlord X or Warlord Y departs Afghanistan. It's like, what do you mean Warlord? Like, yeah, because the U.S. instead of the Taliban, of course, was just turning to warlords. Yeah. warlord not better than taliban <laughs> like you know what I mean? yeah. how does this make any sense but that's what we did and one of the best books on the afghanistan war um i've already talked about restrepo on this podcast i have done two hours on afghanistan if you want to look that video up uh called how was the afghan afghanistan war not a giant um money laundering operation i think that's what the title <laughs> of that video was um watch that it was great we looked into the like the actual the economics the amount of failed pro not failed but projects that were clearly just like just to get some 
contractor rich. Um, but this book called No Country for uh, No Country for Good Men, I believe it's called. No, 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 no good men among the living. Sorry, no country, mm. no good men among the living by Anand Gopal, and he yeah. had this to say um, in response to this Washington Post. Um, reporter saying, I can't understand how a force of over 300,000 with an annual budget of three to four billion dollars equipped with Humvees, MSV, S, MSV, FVs, helicopters, A-29 fighters and advanced weapons is crumbling so quickly and easily. An entire army corps surrendered to the Taliban in Kunduz today, WAPO reports. And Adnan says, because fancy equipment can't provide legitimacy, which the Afghan government and its foreign backers have not had for a very long time. And that's exactly to the point that Nando was making. You know, you cannot force liberation on a people. And to say that is also imperialist. And so I'm feeling very conflicted personally because, I mean, it's not about me, right? I am not in the crosshairs of the fallout of this. But I did march against this war. And I was told time and time again of, by my country, think of the women. Think of the children. Think of the civilians in Afghanistan. This is why we have to go in. This is why we have to bring all of our weaponry into this country that we don't even know where it is on a map, right? Because 9-11, but liberation, but the freedom, but the... Okay, okay, that was shoved down our throats. And so now I've got to muster the same, like some, I have to dust off what is the propaganda of war from real empathy for the people of Afghanistan who've been so dicked around, who've been so deceived and who've been, you know, displaced, murdered, lied to, etc. That is like, I'm trying to hold that, that is safe from the U.S. war machine propaganda that is safe from the, you know, fucking former generals writing open op-eds in the New York Times right now about how we should have gotten out differently. We just, oh, we just wait longer. Oh, do, 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 do it differently. It would have been the same story, fast or slow. It would have been the same. I'm, I'm like, I'm done. I'm just so done with this. I'm so done with this war. Give it to China. You know they're going <laughs> to invade pretty soon. Every superpower invades Afghanistan. Yeah, Shit. I ain't going to do it. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm curious about the U.S. led businesses that are like that have spent the last 20 years building pipelines for oil and gas through Afghanistan and how what's the shakedown of all of that? How is that going to play out for our our interests? Yeah, you know, we spent a lot of time there dicking around. And, uh, you know, honestly, it's like I don't understand how the they could have like strategized this uh, pull out any any worse for the people uh, on the ground. The, I think that it's, the, yeah, I was go just going to respond to that quickly and just say, I feel like this withdrawal, it feels like when you're breaking up with somebody that you know you had a shouldn't be with anyway. You had a bad relationship, the whole thing was bad, or fundamentally things weren't going right. And then when you break up, they say something terrible to you, or they're kind of an asshole, and you're like, we shouldn't have been together. Like, it's the same thing. Like, there's no... There's no like loving good way to get out of a bad relationship. It usually just kind of ends bad. And that's what like, there's no good way to get out of a bad war. That I mean, that's what I firmly believe. And I know that's controversial. And I'll, I know it seems like if we had gone slower, what would have happened? There would have been more firefights, more people dying. That's part of the reason that the president did leave to, you know, to, to avoid bloodshed. So I can't see how we could have done this better. But I do see going forward how some reparations and some actual assistance to Afghans on the ground could potentially help. What we should have done in the first place. Sorry, Nando. No, I mean, I just I just want to point out that, um, you know, you mentioned the the women and children in Afghanistan. That's a, that's a line that you see from a lot of the NATSEC types and the generals and things like that who want to justify um, our continued presence in Afghanistan. And I would always get so annoyed because it was such a cynical use of of that. Like it's like they're you they're almost like using women like like human shields because they don't give a shit about the women of Afghanistan. They, they really do not give a shit about her, about them. Like if they did, they would do this. They would do a humane refugee policy um, to to relocate them to to a safe place. But they that's never on the cards. Um, and yeah. I just want to point out that in 2019, the Washington Post published something called the Afghanistan Papers, one of the biggest leaks um, of Pentagon uh, documents and cables and things like that. Um, 
that yes. basically came and went and no one noticed, <laughs> but it was, yeah. it was huge um, at the time. And uh, it basically said that literally every single thing we heard coming out of Afghanistan from the Bush administration to the Obama administration, to the Trump administration, every single bit of information that was coming out from our government in Afghanistan was a lie. Like all of it, all of it was a lie. And Senator uh, Chris Murphy from Connecticut tweeted, uh, did like a whole little tweet thread uh, yesterday. And when she was like, I went to, I, I was a part of a bipartisan uh, delegation that went to vi visit Afghanistan in 2011 to uh, observe how Obama's surge was going in the countryside. And we went to this, this village and we talked to some of the elders and we asked them like, what's the deal? And they were like, well, the Taliban used to raid our crops. And uh, now, uh, now because the US security forces are here, um, we still sell our crops to the Taliban, um, but they at least pay us in full. They don't like just steal them. And we were like, that's great. And, and then Chris Murphy was like, oh, cool. What do you grow? And he's like, oh, look, this is my giant poppy seed. You know, like they're basically, you know, like the US security forces, they're basically um, protecting a, a heroin trade that yeah. blossomed in Afghanistan after the US invasion that was not there before. Um, and so everything about this was just so absurd, ridiculous, cynical, um, you know, the, the prolonged, the, the justifications for the prolonged presence were always like incredibly hollow and thin. They didn't actually believe any of that stuff. Um, the only thing that mattered was that we kept going and, and that we kept sucking out, you know, resources and, and money and manpower, uh, basically to fuel the U S war machine, which is just a perpetual, um, moving thing that unless, Someone like, you know, bless him, Joe Biden, just pulled the plug. At some point, you just got to pull the plug and it's going to be painful and there's going to be blowback and there's going to be. Oh, the blowback. I mean, there's the political blowback is really is really interesting, right? You know, he's they the right is going to have a field day over this, even though if Trump had won, he would have done the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Trump, in fact, kudos to Trump. Trump was the one who was going to get out of Afghanistan first. He said yeah. we were leaving first. It's like the only thing um, yeah. that I'll give him a shit cookie for. Jennifer, any final thoughts on this? Oh, um, I mean, I'm not saying that uh, you that that I believe, you know, that we should have been there or that I support uh, this being an ongoing thing. But I do think there is going to be um, a huge brain drain. I think there's going to be like consequences for people on the ground. And I think it's going to yeah. stop. And it's like we should no, none of the propaganda that we were espousing to stay there or be there in the first place is at all legitimate. But at the same time, it's like uh, now we've left these people on their own devices unprepared. And it, it's I just think it's not going to it's not going to end well for them. No. Yeah, no. And, and I just I just want to say that, you know, I'm a particularly bitter about this topic. But uh, again, I do think that there can be a road forward. I mean, I, I guess it's such a it's such an example of internationalism that fails when it comes to, you know, international militaries trying to liberate people, you know, and send a few troops from Italy, a few troops from the UK, troops from Australia, troops, 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 just this, yeah, just a international war, occupation, liberation. See how that works? And I think that the people, and I know this feels woo-woo, but I'm going to go there. The people have a different internationalism to show and that I hope we can bring on to this podcast, but that we can also share resources um, of actual organizations that aren't like low-key USAID covers, you know, or like some kind of like neo-colonial yeah. <laughs> yeah, CIA, yeah. But, but like actual things that are supporting groups on the ground who, who are staying, who are trying to live under the Taliban. And look, to be fair to the Taliban, which they don't deserve... But supposedly they're going to like write a law where women can like serve in government and which they have been Afghans got Af the Afghanistan's got like a pretty um, very diverse parliament or did. So like, who knows, maybe they're going to turn over a new leaf. I'm not holding my breath, but I'm just saying like, we can't also come to this with an imperial mindset, even though we don't, you know, like we don't have to, they don't have to be our BFFs, but we also have to respect some amount of sovereignty. So anyway, all that said, it's, fu it's fucked up, but hopefully we can going forward really support the you know people on the ground uh, and circumvent our government, which has been so monstrous on this. 
Oh my god, we're gonna get happy at some point, I swear. Uh, before we go to our final segment, keeping it 100, I think I'm gonna read a few more comments. Um, uh, J Pizzy Rocks on Twitch sounds like Vietnam, we never learn. No, but 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 Blinken said it was not like Saigon. There was mm. no there's no helicopters and roof mm. liftoffs. Yet there still might be. Someone might nab that photo. Um, Sirloins ten fourteen. The goal wasn't to quote unquote win. The goal was to funnel as much taxpayer cash to defense contractors as they possibly could. Yes, and and Nando spoke to that. And I just want to say, when I say failure, I, I've said this in our gi my giant stream on Afghanistan. There was no barometer for what success even looked like. No one knew. Like Malala Yousafzai is in college. That's cool. Was that the barometer? Like, was that it? You know, like what, what was success? You know, nobody knew. Nobody knew. Not even the guys, not even, you know, generals knew what the fuck we were doing there. Uh, Mad Maple Syrup with the interest payments, the war will eventually cost over $10 trillion and won't be paid off until 2050. That's nah, okay. We just write some IOUs. It'll be chill. Uh, Levi Spriggs. So we agreed that Taliban is indeed faster than Amazon two day delivery. Whoa, just about that. They're it's like Taliban Prime for sure. Uh, and thank you, Super Chats, Carrie Venus, Stephanie Smith, Chuck Diesel, Cooking Edibles Dragon, Noemi Green, uh, and Yulva. <laughs> and thank you to our new Twitch subs, Brandy Lou 2, Insatiable Kara, Fat Guy Named Tiny, Donnie C46, Lizzie Nepon, and Pagan Communist. Love y'all. Um, let's go to our final segment, you guys. This is the hundredth episode of this podcast. I'm so happy to be with Jennifer and Nando talking about sad things, talking about anti-vax come. But in order to keep it 100, I'm going to do a final segment of like, what is that take? What is that thought? That like kernel of truth that you have inside of you that you're like, you know what? I don't care on how unpopular this is. This is my truth. Um, let's keep it 100. Okay. I will keep it 100. Even though I hope to be continually in this industry, I do want to say my truth, my keeping it 100, is most television and most movies are garbage. 98.9% <laughs> of all TV shows are trash. I'm sorry. No, I'm not going to. Look, I started watching Ozark. Trash, dude. Like, it was good. It was okay. And then you're like, wait, why is everyone letting this fucking middle-aged white couple have a run of a town? This makes no sense. A mayor of East Ta Town? And everyone's like, no, you got to keep watching it. No. I I'm out of it. As soon as, like, there's a bad actor or, like, a horribly written line. In this case, in, like, Mayor of East Town, like, the first episode. I don't know if you guys have seen it. It's like this like really terrible ex-boyfriend who's like the father of this, this young woman who's killed like uh, of their child. And he's like, why are you such a bitch? You whore. You're just a whore. And you're like, who talks like that? Nobody said, this is the mother of your child. Why would you even like what Hollywood writer You've in the Hills wrote that shit? Yeah, clearly. Maybe that's Did a Philly dialect that we're not aware of. You're a whore. Um, anyway, so when most dramas, most comedies, I don't find them funny. I don't, most, most movies suck. It's that, it's that point. What's it? I'm bad at math. That's my other thing. Whatever the leftover is 1.2% of television and movies that are good. Game of Thrones, worth it until the end. Um, mm. That's my, that is my keeping it 100 opinion. Jennifer, what is your keeping it 100 opinion? I have to say, I totally agree with you. I always feel bad that people are like, what are you watching? What are you doing? What are you consuming? Who's your, f and I'm like, nobody, everybody sucks. I hate it. Uh, this is I'm industry. reading books. Yeah. yeah. Oh, excuse well, me. Okay, excuse party me. Pants with all the books. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. You know from your background. The Bachelor like everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it a good background of books. So I look smart. Yeah. It's all bullshit. Um, yeah. Thank you. I feel validated. No, um, but no, I'm totally validating because I feel like it's all garbage as well. Um, keeping it 100. Uh, I was supposed to go to a shooting range this morning, but I didn't because I was having to outsource my dog and do other things to be ready to be on the show. However, you outsourced uh, yeah, your dog. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, technically. No, you just, put him in a kennel for the show. I love that. I actually have been thinking about renting. Uh, I thought you shipped him off to Mexico. <laughs> not, no, 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 we're not like out. It's not like she's not like, doing like technical support in India. She was like outsourcing. Like I'm pretty much letting people borrow her for the day because oh. she brings so much joy to everyone else's life. She's uh. a super happy dog. But my keeping it 100 isn't about outsourcing my dog. It's about that. Um, I I'm su I super want to learn how to use weapons. That's my keeping it 100. I think. Oh. That we are spiraling. Um, I don't know. The I personally am always like one. I, I have to say I'm kind of I'm one conspiracy theory away from thinking like it's we're going straight to like, you know, some sort of uh, armed some conflict. Sort of zombie oh, apocalypse situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They better be armed. You, the, the, you know what the scariest part for me is the wild packs of dogs. Like I think, you know, Octavia Butler's parable of the sower, like that's part of it. And you're just like. I could deal with the weird, like the like flesh eating zombies, but like the dogs, I'm like, here, sweetie. Like, how do you? I you can't talk no. down a pack of dogs. They don't. You, you, you know? have to. You have to mow them down. I was like cornered. By <laughs> you have to mow them down. You do. I was cornered by a wild pack of dogs in Palestine one day, and I was like, uh, it's me or them. Like, this is a bad scenario. Bro. I don't know how I got out of it, but I was like, I might have to fight my way out of this. Jesus. I gave you way I, more than a hundred. I gave you like hundreds wow. of hundreds. Right? You know, you I, gave me say, mm -hmm. I did a weapons training for a shoot like years ago in 20, this was in 2014. I did like one of those like movie uh, consultants came in and like that works with like actors and teaches them how to hold a gun and stuff. And I, I learned how to do a combat role into a crouching, you know, shooting position uh they would like toss me a pump action action shotgun and i would catch it by the thing and go oh hell yeah and, like, oh aim, hell you yeah. know like i did all kinds That's of cool fun. weapons moves uh i highly recommend it <laughs> it was so fun <laughs> you know, wait, wait. Yeah. this is this was just like a thing you can do or this was training for a movie that you it was for a shoot I... for a show that i was doing yeah in 2014 oh got it Fusion. i thought it was yeah. a group on what happened to the show? Did it come out? It got canceled. Yeah, like everything else. <laughs> you know, it came out, but then it got canceled. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, but it was a lot of fun. I highly, highly recommend it. Someone throwing you. I just want to like, like put, like do a cartwheel around a table and like roundhouse kick and then grab a, yeah, you want to do like a sequence. Like you want to do like a yeah. whole thing. Okay, but keeping yeah. it 100, we have to be armed. I like that. I am a pacifist lib and, uh, or lefty. I'm just like, I don't want to shoot, but, but I, I respect that Jennifer Nando. What are you keeping it 100 about? I I'm keeping it 100 about a woman named Wendy Dang. I don't know if you guys have heard of Wendy Dang. Uh, we were talking about her at dinner last night and I just like, she's one of my favorite subjects because Wendy Dang used to be huh? with Rupert Murdoch. Uh, and then she cheated on him with Tony Blair <laughs> and then oh she's rumored to be Ew. with Vladimir. Ew. And then she's rumored to be with Vladimir Putin. And I'm like, what no. is this woman? She's like from China, born in yeah. China. Um, you know, like a regular one of the billions of people in China, not like a, uh, you know, she wasn't like part of the ruling class or anything like that, who has risen okay. through the ranks to date the th three of the most powerful men in the world and i just feel like someone needs to do a documentary on her like this is a free yeah. idea for anyone in the audience seek out a documentary on wendy dang like what is this woman she must be like the most charming uh, she must have something she was her pussy is made of gold okay it, that I, is... I wasn't gonna say it but like i'm thinking you it, know, you know it like, is what's going on there yeah i mean also i think the people we're talking about not that bright not that smart <laughs> Um, but like, so that helps, you know, when you're like wooing really dumb people and you just, you know, you just fluff them and tell them what they want to hear. But yeah, Wendy Dang, I just go, I just found this Wendy Dang, the evil genius who hangs with Ivanka and probably bangs Putin. Oh, like, and Tony Blair and Rupert Murdoch. T it's funny that out of all like the Murdoch and Putin, the Blair one is I'm like, ew, I, mm, that's the grossest one, right? It's yeah. like somehow the grossest, even though Murdoch yeah. is disgusting and one of my keeping it 100 was like you know maybe we should you know merc murdoch oh i didn't say it um all right <laughs> let's uh let's look at the comments keeping 100 in the comments low key was good vaccines should be mandated audiobooks are better 
whoa, whoa. 98.9% of everything is garbage. Game of Thrones with nothing special. Ooh, shots fired. Um, what else? Okay, um, that is it, you guys. We've done a show. We've done the 100th episode. Holy shit. Jennifer Jajay, thank you for being here. How, how can people follow you and your work? Find me on Twitter at Jen Jajay. It's the best way to follow me. I'm not obviously not doing shows because I'm not a maniac going up doing a five minute bar set and risking everybody's life. So right <laughs> now I'm not doing shows, but I'm on Zoom a lot. And, um, you know, maybe in an outdoor venue coming to an outdoor venue near you soon. Hell yeah. Um, yeah, that sounds lovely. I've been risking it all just for that five minutes of fame. Thank you, Jennifer. Be very well. Everybody follow Jennifer on Twitter. Uh, and take care. Nando Villa, Villa, that was weird. Nando Villa, what do you, what do you, where can the people find you and your work? How can we follow you? At Twitter, at Nando R. Villa is probably the best place or on, you know, the Jacobin YouTube channel. I'm all over the place there. We didn't talk about Messi, Lionel. No. And that's, okay. that's a next shame. Time. But next time we'll make it all about football. You know, the World Cup is coming back real soon, I hear. Um, yes, follow Nando, listen to the weekends on Jacobin or the Jacobin weekends. Um, and thank you so much for joining me. Of course. My pleasure. All right. Take good care. And thank you people out there. I saw some requests for different stickers. You guys, let's roll them out slowly. Let's roll. We're rolling them out. We're getting it done. Uh, but for the time being, Bituationroom.com is where you can go to get your merch. I'm wearing a Frantifa shirt, which has got the backwards uh, Antifa flags as the F, um, you know. And this is a shout out to Marissa Cruz, who did the artwork for the I, the the logo for the Bituation Room way back when and did this. And she's just wonderful. She worked with us at AJ Plus on Newsbroke. She's just the most talented person ever. And... In addition to the most talented uh, people like her are my entire team, Becca Roofer, who's been with me since the beginning of these streams, uh, to Ellie Hoffman, associate producer, rocking it behind the scenes as long as her cat doesn't step on the keyboard, then it's in front of the camera. Um, and to Maximilian Inhoff, who's on the back end of YouTube crushing it, to Alexandra Ornes, who's been helping us out on the socials. We got so many good people. So thank you. Thank you all out there for being um, patron supporters. And hey, if you can't afford it, I get it. Give this podcast five stars on Apple. That truly helps. Let us know what your favorite episode was. I'm so curious. Who do you want back on? Who do you miss? Um, let us know. And all patrons, check out uh, your inbox because I got a code coming to you so you can get um, free swag. Love y'all. And remember, fight the power, fuck the patriarchy, and don't just bitch about it. Be about it. Bye.